for the afternoon, the, uh, our, our final afternoon all together. Um, we've got three more trainings this afternoon, uh, some really great ones. Uh, uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Maliki Brown, who's going to talk us through uh, for an hour this afternoon. Uh, Mal is, was one of the first journalists at Storyful. He was a news editor at Storyful. After that, he was the managing editor of Reportedly, which was part of the Omida network. Um, and now he's with the New York Times and leading video investigations for the New York Times. So please join me in giving a big hand to welcome Maliki Brown. Thanks. I'm, uh, through this presentation, I'm just going to uh, go through how we think about presenting this very dense, very technical type of work with lots of different data points to the broadest possible audience. It's like, you know, um, how do we create a story out of it? Uh, how do we condense it down and, and, uh, and think about all sorts of things like pacing um, and, you know, tricks to play with the subconscious of the viewer um, to, 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 to carry them through um, what is very dense material. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, in great detail the reporting behind it, although I can, I think we'll have time at the end um, <clears throat> for, for some of this. Um, what I'm going to go through are a couple of different examples. Khan Sheikhoun, uh, the chemical weapons attack, which most of you will be familiar with. Um, the reporting behind that, because I think it's relevant to see the reporting and then the final presentation of it and the difference between the two and some of the thinking behind that, and I'm happy to answer questions about that after. Um, I'm going to go through the, the brawl in Washington between um, protesters and the Turkish security guards, and I won't go too um, detailed into the reporting there, but I'll just show you some of it um, in the final presentation. And then I'll talk about like, some of the um, lessons I learned about putting that out onto different platforms on social and also some of the work that Kim and I did um, at Reportedly and lessons from that about reaching your target audience. Um, uh, Kim is absolutely expert on that so you should uh, hit her up for, um, for any advice afterwards. So the first one is um, the, and apologies, I've got my notes here uh, which I'll, and I'll refer to my phone uh, lest I forget anything. Um, so, chemical weapons attack. I'll go through some of the reporting on it um, uh, very quickly. Got it. So this, journal journalistically, what I've sought to do and what, we, what generally we seek to do with um, each of these is to solve a very simple question. And uh, in this case, it's to debunk Russia and Syria's account of it. They have a record of doing this, as we saw from Elliot's presentations, um, of you know, casting doubt on the e available evidence and just saying, you know, it was nothing to do with us. So it's like when and how um, and, and where these things happened uh, is what we're trying to, trying to establish. So um, this was a key piece of evidence in, in, uh, in the investigation. It was a video shot from Khan Sheikhoun, allegedly uploaded on the morning uh, that it happened. Um, and this was important because Assad and Russia said that it happened much later in the day. Uh, you can see here it's dated April 3rd because of the Pacific date timing. It was early morning over there and using Christoph's wonderful tool, got the um, exact metadata and it was uploaded just before 8 a.m. that morning. But I thought it was much earlier um, because you can see in these two, uh, these two frames, one with a bomb landing and secondly with the dust uh, settling, that the sun is just rising over the, the town. So just very quickly go to sun calc, find out what time sun rose at that, um, uh, on that day. And in the lower frame, you see me going down to Google Earth terrain view uh, to those buildings and swiveling around and noticing oh, there's hills to the, to, the, um, to the east here where the sun was just rising over that direction. Uh, so you're gonna have to add maybe five, 10 minutes to sunrise that morning. So it's like putting it around like 6.30ish. Uh, so Sun Calc for Kanchikun on that morning. These dates are uh, Eastern date time, so you add seven hours to it. Um, so there's, there's the hills. I mean, the hills are bigger than that when you look. They're higher than that when you actually see the videos and the photos from the place. Google Earth isn't like an exact representation. 
Um, and then also looking for social media posts, as you do to verify this. What are the first social media posts out describing what happened that morning, at what time were they posted, and what are they saying? Because these are the eyewitnesses that you may want to interview and all the rest of it. Um, some anomalies with Facebook's uh, things, so like, don't underestimate the power of inspect element, right click, get the Unix um, time code for that post. Uh, adding seven hours, I think it was probably 8 a.m., uh, 104 a.m., uh, 8.04 a.m., but this verifies it, and you then you just do your Unix time, time count, stamp converter. Um, I'll skip past that screen because there's some revealing details in it in case anybody's uh, photographing it, but that was just WhatsApp uh, messages that are sent by doctors uh, in the hospitals around that, uh, that area. They coordinate using WhatsApp groups, and I interviewed a doctor. He, got, uh, he told me about this. Then he got uh, screen grabs from his colleague of those messages sent those to our Turkey Bureau, had them verified from two other independent sources who are working in the, in the hospital. So there's kind of quite a high level of verification goes into a lot of the information. The source, uh, same as you would do, like what's his background, what's his affiliations, is he based in Kanshe Kuhn? He is. Um, found a phone number for him on one of the accounts and saw that he was on WhatsApp and uh, interviewed him at length over several days, in fact over several weeks, um, uh, about what happened. It was two weeks I think we, we, we spent reporting on this. Asking him, asking him questions over and back, he would respond via voice. Uh, initially, he agreed that we would, he would be part of the video explaining what happened. Uh, his timing uh, stood up, 7.30 a.m., 7.35, he said he heard it. Also, his voice matched what we were um, hearing in the video, so we knew that this was the uploader, uh, uh, the guy who filmed it. Um, his timing also matched U.S. Um, intelligence. <coughs> Uh, that tracked uh, airplanes to Kanche Kuhn around 6.37 that morning um, and a little bit later, uh, a few minutes later. So this guy said he, he heard them around 6.35, ran up to his roof and started filming and that's what he filmed. Um, so that all stood up. Uh, the timeline of the doctors stood up, um, etc. Uh, the strike points, what was hit? So in Kanche Kuhn, there's loads of minarets there. There's over a dozen of them. So I spent ages going through and plotting them all out. Um, and I can play this video, I think it is video, no it's not. Um, but basically what I wanted to do, in, uh, if you pay attention to, to this point here and this point there, there's so many minarets inside there, it took ages to actually get the right camera angle. Um, but these two gave me like almost my center board because it's a hill off in the distance um, uh, that you can see here. Uh, and it's the line to the camera is running straight through this little building here. So that kind of gave me my center board. Then I worked off uh, all of the minarets in the background there. And uh, thankfully, Bellingcat came out a couple of days later and, uh, and confirmed that they had got the same angles and all the rest of it as well. Um, or the videos next. So basically, this is what it looks like when you map it out. This becomes relevant later for a number of different reasons. So you basically draw all of those lines and, and back to the, to, uh, the house. Um, we were asking uh, the, the guy who uploaded the video um, lots of questions about where, the, where these minarets were um, in relation to his video. He had originally given us a bum steer because he thought that the chemical uh, strike was the cloud that you see to the left. And, uh, and, and that's where that landed. So we had originally... Um, you know, set it, set it all up a little bit further over, um, but the minarets didn't line up with the strike points and some other information that we got, so we kept asking him questions, and then we eventually proved him wrong, and then we showed it, said, is this your house? And at that point, he got really scared, and he actually withdrew from the, he said, feel free to use the information, but please don't use my voice in the, in the video, so you, you obviously respect that. Um, but uh, he went around and he photographed uh, the damage, damaged buildings that day, sent us the original photos, extracted the EXIF data, all of that um, matched up. Um, if you look at the, you know, we got the latitude and longitude and the rest of it. This building that he sent us a photograph of, there was also another video uploaded that day, so that gave us additional corroborating information before we got the satellite imagery. Then we got the satellite imagery, and uh, Christoph gave us a hand with this. And um, he, uh, this showed um, just blown out um, uh, buildings uh, in, a, in a couple of places. And the EXIF data matched these places. And actually, the photos that he sent us matched the patterns in the, in the blown out buildings. So it was all uh, lining up. 
And this was really important as well because this guy, is, as a media activist in County Coo, we really wanted to vet him and to make sure that his testimony stood up. And everything that he was telling us, apart from that one thing that he genuinely mistook um, as a chemical uh, strike, uh, was accurate. Uh, and, and, and other people we interviewed and all of the um, available uh, evidence uh, supported that. So these, these are, those of you familiar with the story, uh, Russia claimed that um, a large depot on the outside of the town was blown up and the chemical weapons were in there. These are the only buildings that matched it. And again, like before and after satellite imagery, uh, found videos of activists going in there and filming it, interviewed them, interviewed it, and a Channel 4 journalist who went there, saw nothing as well. Um, and then also we um, spoke to various different human rights and uh, weapons experts about this uh, critical strike point, which is not seen in the video, but is where the uh, alleged chemical strike happened, and the residue around it, um, the remnants that were left there, and uh, all of that. So, um, and then some more traditional reporting about, oh, we don't have any chemical weapons. Well, actually, um, the, uh, the OPCW says otherwise. Uh, I'll come back to the presentation later, and um, I might just play the video, so you can kind of compare the reporting to what actually went into the final thing. Um, hands up anybody who hasn't seen it, just so I, I can skip through part of this. Yeah, quite a few, so I'll, I'll, I'll play yeah, the The US blames Syria for a chemical weapons attack on the town of Khan Sheikhoum. But Syria and its main partner, Russia, are pushing back. It's not clear whether it happened or not, because how can you verify a video? Well, here's how. Let's take a look at videos, satellite photos, and open source material of that day. They show that Assad and Russia are telling a story that contradicts the facts. So what happened this day? The Syrian attack in the same area was at an, uh, around noon, between 11.30 to 12. Assad and Russia appear to be distorting the facts with this time frame. Because evidence shows the attack happened hours earlier. Now, this footage doesn't show the chemical strike itself, but we believe it does show conventional strikes that occurred during the same bombing run. So what's critical here is the timing. We know it's Khan Sheikhoum because the position of minarets and other points in the video match satellite imagery of the town. This tells us the camera was in a northerly position looking south. The sunrise hitting the minarets shows the attack happened in the early morning. And the US military tracked Syrian aircraft to Khan Sheikhoun around this time. The man who filmed the video backed this up, as did a second activist who sent us footage of the attack. <laughs> This timing matches Facebook posts by the cameraman and other local sources reporting the airstrikes. Doctors in the area use WhatsApp to coordinate services. Soon after the bombing, they started to report casualties who had been exposed to a chemical agent. They started calling for help with a growing number of victims. We spoke with one doctor who received patients at a hospital 60 kilometers away. We started receiving our patients closer to 8.30. The distance between the hospital I was in and the site of attack is about a 45 minute drive. We're happy to turn it away. So, the evidence shows the chemical attack happened well before Assad and Russia claim. We don't know where we're going to send these patients down. In this next clip, pay close attention to Russia's explanation for the chemical attack. Syrian aviation has a bomb in the western region. So I'll just pause it there for one thing. Uh, so we're presenting some of the reporting, as you can see, and I'll, we'll go through like what was left out of it in a minute. But one of the things that we're trying to do here is a not only answer a simple question, but break it down into really simple chapters, because there's a lot for the casual viewer who's not exposed to this type of evidence to try to keep up with and try to um, try to digest. They can pause it and they can go back and all the rest of it. Um, but what we're trying to do is use on-screen cues, like these highlights of the key phrases from the Russian thing. Uh, break it down. You saw the chapter head there just, 
two seconds before. Um, so there are lots of different techniques that we can use and I can show you other examples of that, like fading to black, chapter heads, bringing in a narrator on screen. That kind of subconsciously resets the clock of the viewers, like, okay, I got that back. <coughs> Now, now, what's the next? What's the next uh, chapter? What, what am I? Реакция нанесла удар в районе восточной окраины населенного пункта Хан Шейхун по крупному складу боеприпасов террористов. Nobody said large depot on the eastern outskirts where he claims opposition forces stored chemical weapons. So let's establish what was said in the morning attack. The first video shows what we believe are three conventional strikes. We verified the buildings that were hit using satellite images taken before and after the attack. These comport with photos and videos we received from Khan Sheikhoun. So through these kinds of presentations, you know, what we're trying to do is, I call it real estate on the, on the screen. So what's the available real estate and what information can you present that isn't, you know, just going to, isn't dumbfounding, you know? Um, and how can you guide people like in really clear, crisp graphics through, um, through what you're trying to point out and these little cracks in the buildings and the photograph and, and all the rest of it. The detail we see in these satellite pictures matches the detail that we see in these photos from the ground. These are not large depots, but small buildings and residents of the town told us they were people's homes. And what else was bombed? More videos from that day show a fourth strike nearby. We don't see the strike in the first video, but we know the crater is new because it wasn't there in earlier satellite photos. And many local sources said this road was hit that morning. The location of this strike is central to the claims of a chemical attack. Remember what the Russian spokesman said? He didn't specify an exact location, but the only buildings near the eastern strike points matching his description are this grain silo and bakery. Videos from 2015 show both buildings were bombed out years before the April airstrike. And you'll notice there that Times has a style and every newsroom will have a style of how they want to present their videos. And usually you'll put dates in the upper third, which is a small little black box that you saw for the satellite imagery is up there. But sometimes you just have to break out of those conventions and kind of force your, force no, your style of people. You know, it, it's amazing to say, but you, you have a conversation with people about, you know, putting dates somewhere else on the screen uh, for visual consistency um, uh, and that kind of stuff. But we wanted to make clear, you know, that this is a key piece of the, of the evidence so we kind of pull it out and keep the, keep the same text font and position as some of the other. We were bombed out years before the April airstrike. Could they have been bombed again on April 4? No. The damage we see in this drone footage of the silo, taken just hours after the attack, matches what we see in earlier satellite photos. And the bakery shows no signs of new damage. So what caused the crater that people say is the chemical attack? Eyewitnesses told us that the aircraft made two passes that morning, first dropping a bomb near the grain silo and then dropping bombs across the city. International monitors and the US military also say this is where the chemical attack happened. This isn't the only gap in Assad's interview. Asked if he has chemical weapons? No, no, definitely. Uh, a few years ago, in 2013, we gave up all our arsenal. He's talking here about Syria's agreement to ship out its stockpiles after a chemical weapons attack near Damascus in 2013. Uh, the chemical uh, agency announced that Syria is free of any Chemical material. This is not what the Chemical Weapons Agency said once its operation had ended. Uh, clearly, uh, we cannot say as the uh, Secretary of the OPCW uh, that Syria doesn't possess any chemical weapons anymore. And in a 2016 report... I love how he's laughing there. <laughs> this is just... The OPCW said there are gaps in Syria's account of its chemical weapons program. Syria has yet to explain the presence of four chemical agents. So, that's basically it. Um, so, um, let me just refer to my notes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the visual cues that we were using there are like the motion, what are called motion graphics to just call out certain parts of the evidence that you want to point to and, and connect the dots there. The split screens and the slidings comparing before and after with the satellite imagery, the drone footage, 
uh, all the rest of it. You really want to zone in on the key pieces of evidence that present the case and you're building that up to that sort of final conclusion of, well, here's what happened and uh, here's what all of the evidence is building towards. Um, and then you kind of, in this case, we annotated that again using, um, using bringing back in the map um, because what was struck and where, where the uh, strike points were were critical to this uh, particular case. Um, so uh, that was it. Um, yeah, so basically this, this all simplifies the technical detail. Um, and I think also, you know, there was a lot of stuff that we left behind, including all of the eyewitness testimony. Um, and we interviewed several people as part of that, and we spoke to others who had interviewed many more people. Uh, we didn't include all of that because it wasn't necessary. The eyewitness stuff to me is almost the most powerful part of it. And it's like, here's the evidence layered over their testimony, and this is why you should believe them. Um, and this is why it all adds up. It's not one piece of evidence. It's like the, it's the same as building a case. It's like it's the whole collection of, of it. Um, but we're not going into the technical detail that you might do in an amnesty report or a human rights watch report or a legal case. Uh, but you're trying to just kind of you know distill it all down. Um, uh, this was and um, this was originally uh, almost 10 minutes long, and we, we cut so much of it out. Like we. You know, the reporting that didn't go into it were all of the hospital videos that we verified, the same patients in one hospital, some of them actually being treated in one place and then being moved to another place, which was consistent with what we were seeing in the WhatsApp messages. There was all of this information that we could have included, but it would just got too dense, too bogged down for the lay person who isn't like a Syria aficionado. Um, uh, what else? The sun calc, we didn't include that in there. I really wanted to include that because it's not something that people use an awful lot. And part of this was trying to, you know, educate people that, you know, these things are, these tools are out there to, to, to help you and to let, get, let you do your own fact checking. Um, you know, the hospitals, uh, the interviews with the videographer we had to leave out, but we used the information. He was okay using his name, actually, and we think that that's an alias. Um, yeah, some of the strike points, there were other strike points that we left out of it as well, um, because they were irrelevant to the eastern side of the, uh, of the town. Um, there were some of the technical aspects of the strike point itself. Um, some people had done an analysis of the depth of the crater. There were conversations about, well, you know, if this was a conventional bomb, then the little, um, uh, what you call it, telephone exchange that's right beside where that thing, uh, where that bomb landed would have been blown out, as would some street furniture right beside it on the other side. Uh, what explains the residue that's there on the ground? Um, you know, so there were all of these conversations that was too dense to get into it. We in initially uh, tried to incorporate some of that, um, but really what we wanted to do here was, um, there, was there wasn't anything forensically we could say about that unless you actually were there and got a sample of the thing. And we just wanted to let the evidence speak for itself, not jump to any conclusions, um, but just lay all the facts as we knew them out there and what people were telling us. Um, and then, you know, conclude by, you know, it, you, know you can't say, but, uh, it's leading in one particular uh, direction. Um, and that's what we try to do actually with, with, with these other uh, stories as well. It's like just present the evidence and let that speak for itself and you know, uh, just kind of be minimal in, uh, in it. Um, yeah, what else was there? There's, uh, if I just reload the page, just a couple of other things. You know, for us, we realized, well, how are we going to convey what this story is um, and we felt that we really needed a strong cover image for it and so we got one of our um, graphics editors together on that and um, you know basically the concept was hey we've got all this graphic this satellite mapping stuff going on um, we've got pictures of bombs and we've got a sat and all the rest can you can you do something together and she came up with the triptych idea which I thought worked very well and played very well on social as well um, and then just little bites of it as well. Um, and a strong headline, NYT investigates how Syria and Russia spun a chemical strike. And that's, you know, that's how you, you're, you're teeing, you're preparing the, the viewer with the, the thumbnail and the headline, which are really important in linear videos, at least. Um, the, what else could have been added to it, uh, is something I thought about afterwards, is possibly when you're going through the, through the timelines, that you uh, of the morning is that you you have some sort of annotation to guide the person through what exactly you're doing and you could have that at the top you know 6 30 sunrise 6 35 mom saloon boom 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 and um and that you keep that on screen that's just 
you know, it, it, there's, there's also the case that, that would crowd the screen with all of the other stuff that you're trying to present. So, um, so that kind of stuff uh, are things that we discussed. I'll show you the turkey brawl. Um, again, show of hands, who knows what the turkey, Turkish, doesn't know what the Turkish brawl is in Washington? We all know that story, okay. Um, anyway, so here it is. <laughs> um, so this is one, by the way, if, uh, Premiere is great for this stuff because you can go frame by frame through it, you know, uh, it's really good. Um, so this was, I'll just play it. <laughs> get the picture um, absolute chaos leading up to that there, so the, the, this is uh, anti Erdogan protesters um, and the Erdogan delegation and supporters of Erdogan who have traveled from around the states in the US uh, to come and meet him and uh, he usually does photo ops and, and that sort of stuff with his um, uh, uh, adoring fans uh, when he comes to goes on these kinds of trips there was a skirmish just before that let's pull that one up and you see it starting here, you actually see some of these guys. Watch the guy in the yellow t-shirt. So this happened, there was a standoff, police intervened, kept uh, both sides apart, this guy got clocked in the head. Um, so as the camera is going through here, um, it, when we first saw this story, it looked like there were lots of cameras there. So to my mind, it's like, okay, who done it? In the chaos of the melee, what other visu visual evidence is there that we can uh, collect, stitch together, <coughs> track the movements of these guys, um, and try to put a quick, uh, uh, faces to the actions there in, in the abs absolute chaos and break down those critical moments but use what happened beforehand um, and, uh, and, and do all of that. This uh, walking through the crowd in between the Malays was absolute gold because he did it on, he had, um, uh, it was just an iPhone 6 or 7 and he was going through with a steady cam and got right up and close to, um, or a, what you call it, a gimbal, is that what it's called? Um, anyway, a stabilizing uh, rig and got right up and close to, to all of them. So you're able to identify who you think are the protagonists and then track them from all of the other footage. And I think, I think it was around 20 videos that we collected from people who were across the street, media organizations, and they were all the original files. So to Phelan's point earlier on, they were HD and gave us additional information that wasn't there on the social cuts and everything that was put out on Facebook and Twitter um, and broadcast. So that was it, it was, it, was, it, it, it was as simple as that. It was as painstaking as going through and and, and following these guys and just clocking each one of them, numbering and naming every one of them, so we were cataloging it because again, this was going to be, it was going to get tricky further down the line, so we had to catalog stuff accordingly, uh, particularly when you're, we're working with, I was working with two editors on this uh, and the graphics team as well, so you know, and all there was kind of five of us involved in it, um, and you just want to make sure that you're all speaking the same language about this, um, this kind of stuff. Uh, so I'll show you the story then. Uh, So we chose not to do a linear video with this because you'd be go going back and forth and back and forth, it'd be utterly confusing. So, um, you know, broke it down to, you know, again, a simple question. I'll get to what, what we didn't report on afterwards, but again, who done it? And um, as we went through, I think we had like maybe 10 or less after the first day, but for various reasons, the story was delayed. And every night when I went home, I just kept going through. I was like, oh, there's another guy. Oh, look what he did and all of this sort of stuff. So there were more names coming out and then I was finding names for the civilians and following leads and examining their um, Facebook group.
groups and interactions and all the rest of it. And some of these guys were bragging about it. They did interviews with Turkish media about it afterwards, totally implicated themselves. Um, and, uh, and I managed to get phone numbers for some of them and all the rest of it. I'll go into that later. But the presentation was uh, literally just kind of a lineup um, of these guys. And our graphics editor came up with, um, in my document, I had, um, I had logged down what each of them had done. And he's like, oh, that's great. Let's just put these little things in with the, with the faces. Um, and we didn't do it for every one of them, but like sort of the key uh, protagonists, the fact that these guys were cousins, just kind of conveyed the reporting that we did behind it, um, and all the rest of it. And then, as to my earlier point, chapterizing it. So how do you, again, make sense of who the key protagonists are in this? And the thing to do there was to group them, because you had, and we'll, I'll go through that now, there was uh, men in dark suits who looked like the official security detail, guys wearing a summer uniform who looked like church police, um, and then there were the civilian supporters of uh, Erdogan. And then there was another video that I'll get to in a while, that's Erdogan's detail. Um, so all of these guys, they were all wearing earpieces, several of them were packing guns, uh, they all had um, Turkish breast pins, so they looked like they were part of the, uh, the delegation. So here's how you break it down, and there's a lot of repetition, but you're focusing on different points here. Uh, so the gun, you pu pull out the gun, this guy, you can see the gun as well, um, and then you come back to these guys later on, and he was really hard to find. Um, I think it was about five different camera angles, but I managed to track him through it all. And um, uh, he went in, he caused the damage. What's, what's interesting about these two guys is they weren't there for the first skirmish. They arrived and then they, they kicked off the, the second brawl. Um, and we'll get to that later. But we got a close up of this guy because I was able to track him through the crowd and I got the Turkish presidential seal on his lanyard and the US and Turkish flags. Um, so he was definitely part of that, uh, that detail. They were all wearing these lanyards as well. And you can see here his microphone. Um, and here's another one of them. And you can see these guys, you can actually see their mics hanging off them here. This guy, see his mic swinging up. There it is. So you're looking for like minute little cue, clues within it all, and that's why the HD stuff was really important. Um, this one, you know, there's a melee, seven guys beat up this guy Mehmet, and, um, and we were able to, again, pull out who each of these guys were, um, and just circle them, and do a blowout of, of their faces. This guy choked a woman, slammed her to the ground. There was later a <coughs> photograph of him with the entourage back on the bus. Um, I think we got a name on him later on. Um, somebody emailed me afterwards with names for some of these guys. Uh, men in khaki. So this was a second group, and it was like, just look, these guys, there's two pods of these guys. You're just kind of setting it up, and, uh, and here, here, here they are, and here's what they do. So again, it's replaying the same frame. This might be from a different angle. Um, and what they do, and what this guy does is ridiculous. These are two women who are lying on the ground. You can see he's already punching them, and the camera comes around, he's still punching them. One of those women was knocked out. Um, and here's another group of them. This is after, afterwards, and we go through what they did. You can see this guy, he just checks his fist as he's, as he's coming back out from the, the fight, and you see why here. And then these are the civilians. So, um, as I was saying earlier on, you can call out who these guys are. And we, we managed to name four of them. And we had leads on what, who the others might be, but we felt that we had enough to run with uh, at that stage. And that was one thing that we went back and forth, back and forth, triple check that we had the names, because naming people is really, uh, as you know, um, something that you have to take great care about. Phoned their business, spoke to one of their colleagues who confirmed that they were both down there. They didn't want to speak to the media, sent emails, all the rest of it. One guy did, spoke to me on the phone for about 10 minutes. Um, it's this guy, Sinan Narin. He's been arrested since. So 
So he's called out in the previous video, um, and we just wanted to show this like little filming thing here, and keep, keep filming up on screen so that you can kind of show, you can hear what he's saying up close. This is his camera phone. He posted this to his Facebook page, and this the other angle is from one of the protesters. So we just thought that was a nice little showing off the reporting there. Um, and this is what he does then, he goes in and kicks one of the same women on the ground in the head. Uh, and here's another guy who, uh, there's another guy, uh, and here's another one of them. All the rest of it. And then the president's entourage, so like breaking down, you know, the, the timeline here, and probably we could have done a better job on, on presenting this visually. So what happened was, initial skirmish, police break it up, Erdogan isn't there, he arrives, and uh, this is his head of security talking to him on the phone, and I'll, I'll pull up Bellingcat's video, they did a great triptych on this. Um, they, uh, he speaks into his microphone, and then his guards leave, and literally seconds later, the, the brawl ensues. And it's the two guys who weren't there previously, uh, who are now mysteriously there, uh, who are, in my view, sort of connected uh, via the same communication system, who take an instruction or whatever it was um, uh, and, and uh, launch, launch an attack. So you're kind of breaking that down. Now, we can't say that. All we, can, all we can say is, like, this is what you see happening in the videos, and this is the sequence of events, um, and this is the timing, and there are literally seconds between it. So, um, you know, again, let the evidence um, speak for itself. And this is one of the guy who, who leaves here, goes down the stairs there, this, this guy is this guy here, who you see coming into frame, kicking and punching people. And then he and the other guy return back up to Erdogan's car, and they all go into um, the ambassador's residence together. So, so that was that. Um, so for this one, you know, the concept here was um, really strong visual <coughs> stuff, uh, you know, focused on one thing, so the heads are important and the names, um, and use minimal, to let the, it's highly visual, let the visuals guide the reader through the evidence that you're presenting, minimal text in between, because we know from our um, experience with uh, how users navigate these types of pages that they'll just, they'll get lost, they'll get too bogged down, and they want to watch the videos. Um, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, really high Turkish audience for this uh, time of day. Publishing was really important for that. Um, we published it at 1 a.m. I think it was, or, or midnight. Um, and so that was 8 a.m. or whatever it was in Turkey. So it was hitting the morning traffic. Um, and um, a high mobile audience for it. A uh, high audience for social from it as well. And I can talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. Um, what else left on the cutting room floor for this were full interviews with some of the protagonists and uh, several of the victims uh, in it. They gave great interviews. Uh, they were consistent in, in their narrative, like describing this wall of security forces coming at them. Uh, we chose little bits of, of quotes just to put in there, but um, we left a lot of it um, aside, even though I thought it was powerful stuff. But again, it was to sort of let the evidence kind of do the talking. There's only so much that you can present in there. Um, Another thing that I thought we could have done is the same as this is like an interactive of the victims because you see just how many people attacked every single one of those people and we have testimony and you could kind of do like a, a nine, nine of them went to a hospital, all 12 of them were injured um, and you could do a grid there of those people and show each one of the people, each one of the men who kicked them and what they did and sort of like a baseball card of their comments and, and what have you. There's another way to think uh, interactively and visually around uh, these things. Um, so that's it. Um, just one thing here. So you'll notice a difference here in this video from the, from the other one. So we're focusing in on the main protagonist here, and we slide across, and then we get straight into it. So it's a really short, tight social cut. Nobody's going to watch all of that stuff if you stitch it together on, on social. And the first few seconds on social are really important. Um, and you know, there's a different interaction in psychographic on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and, and all the different ones. 
Kim knows all about that. Um, so you want to, again, same as the cover card for the cover image for the previous one, in a short little video, um, convey what the piece is about and that you're going, to, you're going to be calling out all of these different elements within the video and, uh, and, and that's it. Um, and that traveled quite well. Um, and I think the other, the other, you know, on the main account got kind of twice as much. Um, and on Twitter, then, you know, think about your audience as well. We did a Turkish version of this too, uh, which did okay. And uh, so that's reaching the audience in Turkey uh, who would be interested in this and who'd be aware of it. And again, we did a Turkish video, social call, targeted on Facebook to a Turkish only audience. So that means that nobody else, uh, unless you, you live in Turkey or speak Turkish, only you are gonna see that on the main New York Times account. So it avoids the, rep, the du uh, duplication um, uh, with the previous video that we put out. And that was a shorter video with Turkish annotations. Um, and that didn't get quite the same um, traffic as the, as the previous one, but people stayed with it much more. It was a smaller audience, but the, um, the completion rate was much higher on that video. Um, because it was really relevant to that audience. Um, another thing as well, just about Facebook, everybody knows this, but we posted the video uh, overnight when it was published, like a traditional Facebook post, and it did well, and it got a, a high click-through rate, but we posted another one with the video, and it got a lower click-through rate, but because the video brought it to a bigger audience, the overall audience that came back to it was much higher. Um, so using short little videos, Kanshe Kuhn, we didn't do as well with that. We kind of initially posted the whole video um, and then posted the second version. It didn't quite work as, well, um, as effectively. And it's a harder, denser one to get into in the first like six seconds of, of it. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> so that's it. So sort of like themes that we, the way we think about these, these um, types of stories and presentations <coughs> is like to try to think as minimally as possible um, and not overcrowded and, um, you know, with information. Uh, break it down to the core of what you want to convey um, and answer, answer very simple questions journal, journalistically, journalistically with these types of uh, pieces because, you know, they are so dense with so many different data points. Um, uh, kill your darlings is, uh, is something that editors always say. Um, and that is like, you know, any, anything that is self-indulgent, that is repetitive, that you're showing off about, you know, you just want to cut that stuff out and just focus in on like the core facts that convey the piece. Kanshe Kuhn, you know, we cut it down by 40% um, because, you know, we were, we were laboring on, on a point by showing off the evidence that we had gathered and look how wonderful we are at verification. Um, pacing is really important. I was alluded to that in the, in the textual um, side of things here, text interspersed with visuals but also in, uh, in linear video as well. Uh, particularly these ones that go beyond three minutes, you know, people have a short attention span, so the pacing of that is, 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 uh, is really important to keep it moving along, um, but not too fast. Chaptering, um, as I said, again, this visual technique to kind of reset the subconscious clock in between, um, you know, breakdowns of, of, uh, of these types of pieces. I'm gonna show you another story. I don't know if you saw this last week, but um, we got these, trove of depositions of the architects of the CIS torture program and detainees who were subjected to torture. Um, and uh, they're taking a case basically against the, the architects. And um, I'll just show you the video or some of it. That was a nice little sort of like GIF type effect as well up top of the article to kind of convey we've got the videos. Um, we were soldiers doing what we were instructed to do. This is Bruce Jessen, a former military psychologist who became a CIA contractor, and his colleague, James Mitchell. Uh, any expertise in the art of interview? My God, I'm a clinical psychologist. Interviews are what we do. They've been described as the architects of the extremely harsh interrogation program used at secret CIA prisons after 9-11. So again, how do you focus on the key information on this just Jim and I went into a cubicle sat down, at a, a, he sat down at the typewriter, and together uh, we wrote out and typed up the list that I've seen in the documents here uh, that was submitted. They're now defendants in a case brought by some of the men tortured in those prisons. Suleiman Salim, Mohammed Ben Soud, and Obaidullah. 
the nephew of Gul Rahman, who died in custody. This is the first time that Mitchell and Jessen are facing lawyers for former detainees. We exclusively oh, obtained sorry. video depositions from the case, which is scheduled for trial in September. Watch throughout as Mitchell and Jessen attempt to defend themselves, both rhetorically and emotionally. If I, sorry. I want to get information from you, Dor. So the challenge here is this is not a visual story. What the tapes are critical to the story. And how do you come up with a visual concept that shows the tensions you know, between these guys having to answer questions for the first time, um, you know, the, the story that they're presenting and the defense that they're presenting between themselves, the juxtaposition of what they're saying and how they're rationalizing versus the experience of it um, as uh, the evidence of the people, uh, the detainees give. So anyway. I don't want to slap you. So this split screen effect is one of the thing, techniques that we thought we would use. And then, you know, interspersed with Cherie coming on camera to say, okay, you need to pay attention to this point, and she gives the context. Um, and I yeah, don't want to wall you. I don't want to waterboard you. Uh, even if you're my enemy. Jessen, who's never spoken publicly about his role, at times appears to wrestle with what happened, whereas Mitchell, who wrote a book about his experiences, comes off as more polished and assertive. I disagree with this, the suggestion that we we were architects because we weren't breaking new ground, you know, in the sense that uh, that architects do. Mitchell and Jessen didn't directly interrogate the two surviving men who brought this. So even though we're not using chapter titles here, we're using a visual effect where she comes on screen to intersperse like different things that we're trying to present and a fade to black and then bring it back up kind of thing. Case, but the methods they proposed were used on them and at least 37 other men. A fascinating aspect of these videos is how their accounts of enhanced interrogation dramatically differ from what the detainees describe. I'm a pretty good judge of what it's like to be mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, <laughs> I remember also them putting a cloth around, tying a cloth around my neck, and then they are punching me on the wall. Oh, it's discombobulating. It's not painful. Um, um, my guess would be that some of the folks sitting here have been wrong. It, it stirs up your inner ears, and uh, it's like being on one of those whirly gigs or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you move around quite a bit, and, and, uh, and you, you know, uh, it's, in fact, you, if it's painful, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Handicapped on the wall. Handicapped. Handicapped. I couldn't go up or come down. This is Jose Rodriguez, former head of the CIA's counterterrorism center. On 60 Minutes, where you um, analogized the stress positions to um, working out in a gym. Correct. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that? So you get a sense of what we were trying to picture there, but there were multiple examples of the same sort of characters through it, and you're just trying to pick things out. You know, Mitchell, who's very well versed, spoke, you know, spoken on media. Uh, shows publicizing his book through it all, um, whereas um, uh, Jessen has been interviewed for the first time and um, there's quite a difference between them. Um, uh, what else was I going to show? Yeah, that's it basically, you know, let the evidence speak and trust your reader, your viewer. Um, and. Um, you know, again, just to, to emphasize the eyewitness interviews, I know that, uh, you know, sometimes you, you're not putting that out there to protect eyewitnesses, um, but for us, if you can do it in a safe way, then it really lends to the reporting, I believe, uh, of, of these types of pieces and strengthens the piece um, as ground up reporting. Um, yeah, this is uh, another presentation style. I'm just going to show you something else. Uh, get rid of that one. Oh yeah, of course, then, you know, the anatomy of, of these investigations, you know, basically taking the opportunity once the story goes out to kind of show the, the making of, and, uh, and that's where you can get into technical detail and you're speaking to a different audience and this is stuff that Phelan and, 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 uh, and uh, Elliot and everybody else um, has done and, and stuff that you, you do day in, day out. This is one, um, again, that we did reportedly with Kim, um, tracking bombs to... Uh, from Italy to 
um, Yemen, to on the ground in Yemen. Uh, are you familiar with this story? Anybody? Show of hands again. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll play it because this is when we were in a startup and we had very few resources and I might just give you some ideas about, you know, things that you can use to, to put, put a video together. An investigation by Reportedly has found that bomb parts manufactured by Italian weapons company RWM Italia were shipped in May 2015 to the United Arab Emirates, one of the countries actively bombing Yemen. Loaded in six containers aboard the Jolly Cavalto at Genoa Port, the bomb parts were shipped through the Suez Canal and onto Jeddah, where transit permits were granted by Saudi ministries at the behest of the United Arab Emirates Embassy. The shipment was transported around the coast of Yemen and on to Dubai, where it was unloaded and transported to Burkham Munition Systems, an arms manufacturer in Abu Dhabi. Burkham's MK-80 series aircraft bomb is a general multi-purpose ballistics bomb. Our aerodynamically streamlined LDGP bombs are perfect for situations where maximum blast and explosion is required. They can be dropped free fall or used with precision guidance kits. Documents seen by reportedly show that Burkhan supplies these bombs to the UAE Armed Forces. Separate evidence collected by Human Rights Watch researchers and reviewed by reportedly shows that MK-83 bombs bearing the labels of RWM Italia were dropped on this building in Sada, northern Yemen. Video shared by a local YouTube uploader and independently geolocated and verified by reportedly shows the damage to the building. No civilians were killed in this attack. However, human rights documenters believed it is likely these munitions were used in potentially unlawful bombings in Yemen. RWM Italia is a subsidiary of the German arms and automotive company Rheinmetall Defence, and until 2012, Burkham was also a subsidiary. Financial funds who invested in Rheinmetall. So, yeah, the so the idea here is, I mean, we had no resources and no edit. You know, I'm not an editor, and that's me editing it, and it's terrible, terrible VO and everything. But um, using Google Earth to sort of show the global scale of this industry and this thing, and, and how it's taken, it, it, that was the concept behind it um, and just kind of something to uh, put in your heads and um, and it, it was all the techniques that you, you might use but in reverse because we, it, this one started with documents not with videos and it was like well how do you trace the documents it was like getting the shipping logs for that ship um, does Burkan, do, do they make these particular bombs uh, who is Burkan, who, is, who are they owned by um, you know, uh, getting the photographs from knowing that the uh, researchers uh, for Amnesty and Human Rights Watch were in country. Have you seen these bombs on the ground? Oh yeah, we have actually, and here are the photos. Get the metadata, uh, use Wikimapia to find out what that building was. Are there any videos? So you're working backwards to get the videos. Are there any videos on YouTube that match the description of this building on Wikimapia? There are. Oh, that happens to be the day after the photographs were taken. Uh, or the day before the photographs were taken and all of that. So you're, you're stitching it all together in that way. And also then just thinking, okay, we're going to do a video on this. What else do I need? Are there any ship watchers in Genoa uh, have these liners being um, filmed coming out, big B-roll basically, um, uh, and all the rest of it. And then follow the money. Who, who are the shareholders uh, in this company? Um, there's an interesting backstory there actually. There's a campaign of... Um, um, this investment from this uh, company in Germany um, because of their arms exports, but their subsidiaries in other con countries are sending tear gas to Bahrain and arms to uh, forces bombing Yemen. Last week, actually, there was another ship went out with 2,000 bombs. Um, uh, their, their export licenses have shot through the roof, and uh, these were all granted by the guy who was then the foreign minister and who is now the acting prime minister of Italy. Um, and they're, they're continuing. I think there's been ship six shipments. An interesting thing about this story actually is it created this little online community on Twitter and Facebook uh, in Sardinia and um, uh, Connor helped with this as well. Um, you know, they would send us uh, videos and send tweets and tag you on tweets when there were new shipments going out and go down there and film aircraft taking off and ships uh, taking off. So there were two subsequent stories um, and we live tracked the shipments of where they went uh, by tracking the airplanes and the, and the uh, ships. Um, and tweeted them out. And actually, sorry, just another another way of presenting something again that's dense like that is uh, on Twitter. Um, and 
you know, doing a Twitter thread and breaking it down, uh, leaked Saudi cables, allowed us to trace our arms supply from Italy. So you set it up, and then you go through all of the different piece, pieces of uh, evidence, um, and you like chop it down into short little videos um, showing the, the track of the ship, where it went to, etc. Um, so these are other ways to get into the, the thing. So this is kind of with a mind, I don't know if DBC goes online with social profiles or what have you in time, but um, these are things where you can break, break it down. And these travel quite well because the journalistic and human rights community are very active on Twitter and um, you know, you've, got a, you've got a receptive audience there uh, who, who share it widely and kind of spread the, the work uh, and the skills. So, and again, threading it, <coughs> replying to yourself repeatedly allows you to kind of collect all of these things and then you can just reshare that thread again when, when the story reemerges or when it's opportune to do so. Um, yeah, so you kind of keep a record of it. Um, it also kind of brings people in. Um, if you kind of if you thank them, uh, you know, people who help to resources, as long as they're 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 happy with that, and that kind of lent itself to creating this little online kind of Twitter community. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Probably enough of me talking. Yeah, another thing for this um, for us is we seeded these as a startup with not a big, large audience. Uh, who are the other publishers out there that might be interested in this? So we seeded these stories out to um, publishers in Italy, Spain, Germany, um, Norway, um, and a couple, couple of other uh, publications within those countries. Um, and so that's reaching the audience that matters again, same as translating the Turkey piece and targeting them on social to those uh, to those audiences as well. We did a, another investigation in uh, Ecuador. We tar we did cut a Spanish only version of that video, put it up onto Facebook, targeted an Ecuadorian audience, um, and that uh, did quite well over there and actually forced the ministry in charge of. Um, it was about a, a, an oil road being cut through the Amazon forest and. Um, the Ministry from the Environment cut their own sort of eight minute video rebuttal, but that kind of uh, again raised its own awareness of, um, uh, of the story. So, there are some of the techniques. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, that was brilliant. Yeah, it was really, really, really good. I was wondering how you approached the discovery of content. Yeah, the, I mean, the main thing is, um, you know, I always say to people is put yourself in the uploader's shoes. Like there are, say, the Khan Shekun thing, for instance, you know, it's obviously you get the Arabic for Khan Shekun and you start looking for the earliest instances, but how else, how else are people describing a particular event? Are there acronyms? Are there slang for local thing, for, you know, police forces or whatever it is that people are using uh, that you might not be aware of or that Google will mistranslate for you if you don't have language support? So it's about uh, doing that research. Um, you know, the Ivory Coast one was a particular, you know, a, a prime example. It was that started not with the video, but with actually googling the hell out of what was going on over there and where these protests were held and on what dates and, and, and where to narrow down the search before you actually interrogate the, the video. So doing lots of that in historical um, Twitter searches and that sort of thing. In terms of tools. You know, we all know one of the challenges that we have is, is that um, a lot of information disappears unless you're gathering it right as the thing happens. Um, and that's because Facebook search is so difficult. Um, the Twitter firehose will present only a certain amount of uh, information after a certain period. Um, so, you know, you know that's, I think that's one of the things that could be really a really strong aspect of this group is that you know once you know that there's a serious event that you kind of have a call to arms and you just start gathering every single bloody thing um, and logging it. Um, but tools, again, advanced Twitter search is really good for me. I use a thing called SamDesk, um, which uh, allows you to search multiple platforms at once. And you can do geo search as well as um, uh, keyword searches and combinations. Um, and I can give you a little demo of that if you want, actually, um, uh, in a second. It also allows you to collect pieces of evidence into a, into a bucket as well as you're going. Um, so, uh, so there's that. Facebook Signal um, is what I use as well. 
We don't use Banjo, but it's really good for breaking news uh, situations. Uh, Storyful have their own tools as well, uh, which are quite good. Um, what else is there? Um, Montage I use occasionally, uh, which is montage.storyful.com. It's built by Google, given the Storyful to manage. And that allows you to do advanced YouTube search. So basically YouTube search within a date range. It also allows you to create collections. Um, so all of, those, all of those sorts of things. And then there's a whole bunch of other tools for interrogating the data um, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so they're, the, they're the main ones. Um. <clears throat> I'll just show you like a collection. So say for instance, uh, you know, the day after Donald Trump was elected, uh, there were walkouts at universities and schools across the states. And that was a really easy one to, to gather content on. And I literally just put in Trump protest. And you know, uh, in, in the search, you can filter for different content types and different platforms. So, and then I gathered them all into this bucket, basically this collection. And as I did outreach to the various different um, people, I would mark it as cleared or verified. And then you can just quickly go to the source. Of the video. <laughs> and it allows you to save the video right there. So it understands where the video file is, is saved on the platform and you get the high res uh, video and all that sort of stuff. Um, so in here, for instance, um, you can also create you can also create effectively Twitter lists but across multiple platforms in here as well. That's really cool. So if, you, if you've got a geo search on Mosul or whatever it is and you're finding people that you, you know are in Mosul because you're doing little background <coughs> checks on them, you've got an Instagram user, a YouTube user, a Twitter user, you're banging them all into the same list and this is like, that's, that's really good. Um, so let me just create like a new search there and just put in Trump. And So you can see here the media types, text, send me pictures, send me videos. So video is obviously, you know, me in the video department, this is what's interesting to me, but text is also good because um, you get eyewitnesses and that kind of stuff um, uh, and leads there. And then you can choose your platforms to switch on and switch off. It doesn't have Facebook, it's raw feed, feed but you can add in Facebook lists if you've got lists of people on Facebook um, uh, or interest groups, you can add those in here. And then, uh, so let's just switch that off. The UI needs a little bit of work, but. There you get the idea. And then you can like, you know, add that to a collection. save them for later. And if the asset is then deleted, it's, it saves a record of it. Yep. Um, I have three questions if we can try to squeeze them all in. Firstly, I'm wondering, are you using any crime analysis software tools like Palantir or any of that, or is this like all like graphics and other main tools um, from no. a design perspective? We're, we're not using Palantir, no. Um, uh, however, there are groups out there who are using it who have great uh, data visualizations, and that's something that we're, we're considering just kind of uh, in terms of like, research partners on, on stories when the story warrants it. Yeah. So, what's their main tool? Is it just through Premiere and some graphic overlay? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, secondly, I was wondering, given that New York Times is such a you know a massive media outlet, in terms of your legal counsel giving advice on either protection of vulnerable peoples or potential um, litigation against you. Is there like a crib sheet on that? Like how to... Yeah. Because <laughs> I know there's, you know, the rule of thumb you mentioned, like verify two or three other sources for this fact, but um, yeah. is there anything you can share on that? Yeah. Um, Go ahead, yeah. And, yeah, the last question was just, this is so inspiring that you're kind of drawing out the key storytelling um, pointers. 
and it makes me think of a couple of years ago there was a lot of donor interest in how to create um, storytelling on human rights experiences. So I was wondering if um, there's any similar um, like distilling of the lessons that you're talking about um, and how you kind of gauge the effectiveness of different um, modalities of story presentation in your in your space? Yeah, um, first, uh, second question, um, we kind of have our, our own reporting guidelines, like the Times actually is a big organization and different, different groups of different, you kind of have overarching ones about standards and ethics and, and that sort of stuff, and most journalists will abide by, by, by those. Um, for us, in terms of what we're reporting, it's, you know, you basically, you're not, you're, you're trying not, you're not taking any chances, basically, with, with it, and you want to get as many different um, sources as possible. Who's your second, who's your third source, what are your different sources, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's it. So you kind of have your own, and you have your own gut feeling as well about, about stuff. Uh, Kan Shikun was so, it, like, you know, there were periods there where I was sweating it on, on that story, you know. But then, you know, another piece of evidence would fall into place. And I was like, I'd be like, of course, you know. And how did I overlook that yesterday? But when you're like head down in it, and then you talk to somebody who's spoken to a couple of dozen people on the ground, and that totally reinforces it, even though it doesn't make it into the reporting. But it's just like it's that rigor that's there behind the reporting, because um, you, you, on something like that, you really just don't want to screw up. Um, uh, the in terms of legal counsel usually will be about um, yeah putting people at risk and I don't think it's understood how the very many ways that you can put sources at risk by even just doing outreach to them like that's not understood across the, jour the, the, the journalism community so the fact that this guy was on WhatsApp get, allow, enabled us to to um, to talk to him um, but there's all sorts of rules that, you know, about destroying notes, about destroying conversations, making sure that sources delete conversations with you and all that kind of stuff. That isn't done routinely or standardized across the industry that could be. Um, uh, and our legal advice would mainly be around sort of maybe rights and, uh, and certainly people as well. You know, if you had any questions about people, you would, you would put, the, put, put that to our standards editor, who's very responsive. That kind of stuff. Um, you know, questions about, uh, we're borderline on this, you know, like I remember one instance with the uh, Turkey, Ataturk airport bombing, um, I was pretty sure that the CCTV wa was the thing, but it, it could have been another uh, airport, and it's like, at that stage, you know, you might, if you're going to lead with that on a video, on a breaking news video, <coughs> when time is of the essence, you, you might just like say, these are the reasons why I think it is, um, and this is the source and all the rest of it, and you kind of, you know, Unless you see it yourself, you're not going to be, you're never going to be 100%, but you can get 95% of the way there, and it's kind of a judgment call. So, does that answer that? Yeah. And then, sorry, the last question was, um, I don't know, that's a tricky one. Um, like, for us, we kind of have a template of motion graphics that we can draw from, and, you know, we've got motion graphics designers as well, then, who you can pull in to do more sort of... Um, uh, complex work, uh, but usually that, that template and that visual consistency is important to the style folks, um, and uh, you know that that can be a sort of like a guiding template for for some of the things that you might be looking to call out in a, in a particular video. Um, the other thing is like, you know, to me the Kanchi Kun one would have been better as a visual story, like the Turkey in the format of the Turkey Brawl one rather than a linear video. Uh, a linear video it took an awful lot more work. You have to be really careful with the scripting of it and what you're actually saying in the scripting. You know, we had multiple versions of, the, of the, the script for that one. I think we had over a dozen versions of it. And you're re-recording the script and you're re-intonating it and you have to remember like, you know, what stage you are in the video and all the rest of it. So in many ways, an actual visual story where the visuals carries you through, the text, uh, being able to write and tee up a particular thing is much easier production lift, I think, and uh, can be a better experience as well. It just depends on the, on the thing, on the story. Also, for, um, for Google pur purposes, and again, this depends on whether it's news or whether you think it's going to create news and it's going to, and it's going to rank in Google, a text piece over a linear video that has far less metadata 
is, is going to do much better. So that's a consideration as well. And understanding who your audience are, where they are, how they're consuming it, what time of day. You know, like both of those stories have push alerts out to the NY Times audience on the mobile apps, so they got good mobile traffic. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, it depends on, depends on messaging that and all that kind of stuff as well, yeah. So there's all, all sorts of different considerations. Um, basically said that we were um, aligned with the Gullenists and that um, was the foreign minister was asked a couple of days later and that we are constantly attacking Erdogan and um, well, that, was, that was kind of the response. Are the same people doing that that are doing the kind of geolocation and more open source working on Facebook profiles, or are those seen as kind of two separate tasks and kind of specialization? Yeah, you'd, you'd be doing you'd be doing both of them, um, and yeah, yeah. It, dep it depends if if you're in a company like Storyful where you've got lots of experts at these things and regional experts and stuff like that, you might, you might kick over one particular task to a person. Um, but that's not always the case in, in different organizations, yeah. Well, I guess the follow-up question would be, I think we're all interested in our DBC and getting better at doing kind of open source investigation. Resources for that, so what sort of free training, are there any platforms we can use to find these PDFs or get more military-based documents or something like that? Um, so basically exploring options outside of a specialized team. Yeah, there are all sorts of specialists out there. It's just a matter of finding who they are. And it's like, it's banging the phone out all the time, asking questions. Like that Yemen investigation, I must have talked to 20 people um, because it was my first time doing a sort of like an arms um, shipment <coughs> type piece and I wanted to understand the legality about these documents and why would like permits be sought and all the rest of it. And even if somebody couldn't help me, I would ask them, who can help me or who can you put me in touch with and it leads it leads you to, to all sorts of different groups as a result of that I'm in like different Facebook groups now that are that I have recourse to if I have an arms question about Kan Kuhn and you know all of that sort of stuff so it's about doing the legwork yourself really like being a reporter and just like there, there are tons of experts out there and going to marine traffic and saying okay yeah, you know could I could you follow me for a DM or is there like have you got encrypted mail or whatever it is that you need to do People will help, you know, if they if they feel that there's a story that the, that's that's worthwhile while doing. Um, so they were very helpful um, to me in that in that as well. Yeah. Flight radar as well for all those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so going off of that, in your experience, um, are experts in this field generally pretty open to sharing their practices and methods, or like, is there any area where there's kind of sensitivity about? Um, maybe people wanting to like, keep their methods to themselves or things like that? I think methods, definitely there is. Um, I think stories are different and that there are people can want to keep certain things under wraps until they, they publish. And of course, that's uh, perfectly understandable. But m in my experience, when I've sought help from people, it's a give-take situation. I, I say that at the end of this, this anatomy of an investigation piece. It's like, be generous and trust people, you know? Um, I share information with them and they, they find that really interesting and I'm digging st stuff up and they're coming back to me with other information and like we're adding value all of, all of the time uh, to each other's work and, um, and it's, you know, even if it's not something that they end up publishing, um, uh, you know, it's, still, it's, it's still useful for them to, to know and be aware of, particularly for in-country things like I think Amnesty in Italy, for instance, kicked off a campaign off the back of some of this stuff um, and yeah, so I find that, you know, occasionally there'll be times when people might be a bit short with you in communications and you basically just have to charm them, you know, and say, well, listen, this is, you know, here, here, here's a little bit of what I have, what have you got kind of thing, you know, and, and, and that sort of stuff. If you're working with human rights organizations, then they have, you know, we're under a little bit more pressure to get news out. Um, and our investigation won't be as deep and as thorough as theirs uh, or as dense, but it's different audiences, different purposes, and, you know, uh, 
I've, you know, I've never been asked to, to not publish something, basically, unless it's protecting um, a, a witness or, some, or a source. Yeah. And I think particularly around human rights, you know, there, there is definitely a collaborative spirit out there. There's, there's a healthy competition out there, but there's a collaborative spirit too, I think, you know. <laughs> And, I, and I'll just, if there are no more questions, I think this project has tremendous potential for you know, all, all of this type of work, scaling this kind of work, having eyes out there for stuff that, uh, that, that journalists are missing. You know, journalists can be very insular and, and narrow looking uh, at their publication and their lines of coverage, and there's a world of stuff out there that's being missed, and there's evidence out there that, that can be gathered. And I think there's all sorts of different applications for what, what, what you're doing, provided it's, um, it's a sustainable uh, thing. So well done. Uh, thank you very much.